the Chronicles of Conan the Barbarian. The Hand of Nurgle. Written by Robert E. Howard. was torn from the young warrior's grim-set lips. He threw back his head, sending his tussled shock of black hair flying, and lifted his smoldering eyes skyward. They widened in sheer astonishment, an eerie chill of superstitious awe ran through his tall, powerfully built body, which was burnt brown by fierce wasteland suns. Broad-shouldered and deep-chested, lean of waist, long of leg, and naked save for a rag of cloth about his loin and high-strapped sandals. He had entered the battle mounted as one of a troop of irregular cavalry, but his horse, given him by the nobleman Marillo in Corinthia, had fallen to the foeman's arrows at the first onset, and the youth had fought on afoot. His shield had been smashed by the enemy's blows. He had cast it aside and battled with sword alone. Above, from the sunset smoldering sky of this bleak, wind-swept Turanian steppe, where two great armies were locked in a fury of desperate battle, came horror. The field was drenched in sunset fires and bathed in human blood. Here the mighty host of Yildiz, king of Turan, in whose army the youth served as a mercenary, had fought for five long hours against the iron-shod legions of Montasam Khan, a rebellious satrap of the Zamorian marches of northern Turan. Now, circling slowly downwards from the crimson sky, came nameless things, whose, like the barbarian, had never seen or heard of before in all his travels. They were black, shadowy monsters, hovering on broad, arch-ribbed wings like enormous bats. The two armies fought on unseen. Only Conan, here on this low hill, ringed about with the bodies of men his sword had slain, saw them descending through the sunset sky. Leaning on his dripping blade and resting his sinewy arms for a moment, he stared at the weird shadow things for they seemed to be more shadow than substance, translucent to the sight, like wisps of noisome black vapour or the shadowy ghosts of gigantic vampire bats. Evil, slitted eyes of green flame glared through their smoky forms. Even as he watched, nape hairs prickling with a barbarian's dread of the supernatural, they fell upon the battle like vultures in a field of blood, fell and slew. Screams of pain and fear rose from the host of King Yildiz, as the black shadows hurtled amongst their ranks. Wherever the shadow devils swooped, they left a bloody corpse. By the hundred they came, and the weary ranks of the Turanian army fell back, stumbling, tossing away their weapons in panic. Fight you dogs! Stand and fight! Thundering angry commands in a stern voice, a tall, commanding figure on a great black mare sought to hold the crumbling line. Conan glimpsed the sparkles of silver gilt chainmail under a rich blue cloak and a hawk nosed, black bearded face, kingly and harsh under a spired steel helm that caught the crimson sun like a polished mirror. He knew the man for King Yildiz's general, Bakra of Akif. With a ringing oath, the proud commander drew his tulwar and laid about him with a flat of the blade. Perhaps he could have rallied the ranks, but one of the devil shadows swooped up on him from behind. It folded vaporous, filming wings about him in a grisly embrace, and he stiffened. Conan could see his face, suddenly pale with staring frozen eyes of fear, and he saw the features through the enveloping wings like a white mask behind a veil of thin black lace. The general's horse went mad, 
and bolted in terror. But the phantom thing plucked the general from his saddle. For a moment, it bore him in mid-air on slowly beating wings, then let him fall, a torn and bloody thing in dripping rags. The face, which had stared at Conan through shadowy wings with the eyes of glazing terror, was a red ruin. Thus ended the career of Bakra of Aki, and thus ended his battle as well. With its commander gone, the army went mad. Conan saw seasoned veterans with a score of campaigns under their belts run shrieking from the field like raw recruits. He saw proud nobles fly screaming like craven serfs, and behind him, untouched by the flying phantoms, grinning with victory, the hosts of the rebel Satra pressed their weirdly won advantage. The day was lost, unless one strong man should stand firm and rally the broken host by his example. Before the foremost of the fleeing soldiers rose suddenly a figure so grim and savage that it checked their headlong, panic-stricken flight. Stand, you fatherless curs of my crom! I'll fill your craven bellies with a foot of steel! Back if you set any value on your sniveling lives, you white-livered dogs! Back! Or I'll spill your cowardly guts at your feet! Are you women to fly from shadows? But a moment ago you were men! I, fighting men of Turan! You stood against foes armed with naked steel! Fought them face to face! Now you turn and run like children from night shadows! Fuck! It makes me proud to be a barbarian! To see you city-bred weaklings cringe before a flight of bats! For a moment he held them, but for a moment only. A black-winged nightmare swooped upon him, and he, even he, stepped back from its grim, shadowy wings and the stench of its fetid breath. The soldiers fled, leaving Conan to fight the thing alone, and fight he did. Setting his feet squarely, he swung the great sword, pivoting on slim hips with the full strength of back, shoulders and mighty arms behind the blow. The sword flashed in a whistling arc of steel, cleaving the phantom in two. But it was, as he had guessed, a thing without substance, for his sword encountered no more resistance than the empty air. The force of the blow swung him off balance, and he fell sprawling on the stony plain. Above him the shadowy thing hovered. His sword had torn a great rent through it, as a man's hand breaks a thread of rising smoke. But even as he watched, the vapory body reformed. Eyes like sparks of green hellfire blazed down at him, alive with a horrible mirth and an inhuman hunger. Oh, Krom! It may have been a curse, but it sounded almost like a prayer. He sought to lift the sword again, but it fell from nerveless hands. The instant the sword had slashed through the black shadow, it had gone cold with an aching, stony, bone-deep chill, like the interstellar gulfs that yawn blackly beyond the farther stars. The shadow bat hovered on slowly beating wings, as if gloating over its falling victim, or savoring his superstitious fear. With strengthless hands, Conan fumbled at his waist, where a strip of rawhide bound his loincloth to his middle. There, a thin dagger hung beside a pouch, his fumbling fingers found the pouch, not the dagger hilt, and touched something, smooth and warm within the leathern bag. Suddenly, Conan jerked his hand away as a tingling electric warmth tore through his nerves. His fingers had brushed against that curious amulet he had found yesterday when they lay encamped at Bahari, and in touching the smooth stone, a strange force had been released. The back thing veered suddenly away from him. A moment before, it had hovered so close that its flesh had crawled beneath the unearthly chill that seemed to radiate from its ghostly form. Now it tore madly away from him, wings beating in a frenzy. Conan dragged himself to his knees, fighting the weakness that pervaded his limbs. First, 
the ghastly cold of the shadow's touch, then the tingling warmth that had seethed through his naked body. Between these two conflicting forces, he felt his strength draining away. His vision blurred, his mind wavered on the brink of darkness. Fiercely, he shook his head to clear his wits and gazed about him. Mitra! Krom and Mitra! Has the whole world gone mad? The grisly host of flying terrors had driven the army of General Bakra from the field, or slain those that did not flee fast enough. But the grinning host of Mutasim Khan, they had not touched, had ignored, almost as if the soldiers of Yarale and the Shadow Nightmare Things had been partners in some unholy alliance of black sorcery. But now it was the warriors of Yaralet who fled screaming before the shadowy vampires. Both armies broken and fled. Had the world indeed gone mad? Conan wildly asked of the sunset sky. As for the Sumerian, strength and consciousness drained from him suddenly. He fell forward into black oblivion. The sun flamed like a crimson coal on the horizon. It glowered across the silent battlefield like the one red eye that blazes madly in the Cyclops' misshapen brow. Silent as death, strewn with the wreckage of war, the battlefield stretched grim and still in the lurid rays. Here and there amidst the sprawled and moving bodies, Scarlet pools of congealing gore lay like calm lakes reflecting the red, streamed sky. Dark, furtive figures moved in the tall grasses, snuffling and whining at their heaped and scattered corpses. Their humped shoulders and ugly, dog-like snouts marked them as hyenas from the steppes. For them, the battlefield would be a banquet table. Down from the flaming sky flapped ungainly, black-winged vultures, come to feast on the slain. The grisly birds of prey dropped upon the mangled bodies with a rustle of dusky wings. But for these carrion eaters, nothing moved on the silent, bloody field. It was still as death itself. No rumble of chariot wheels or peal of brazen trumpets broke the unearthly silence. The stillness of the dead followed fast on the thunder of battle. Like eerie harbingers of fate, a wavering line of herons flapped slowly away down the sky toward the reed-grown banks of the river Nisvaya, whose turgid flood glinted dully crimson in the last light. Beyond the further shore, the black-walled bulk of the city of Yaralet loomed like a mountain of ebony into the dusk. Yet, one figure moved through the wide-strewn field of ruin, pygmy-like against the glowing coals of sunlight. It was the young Sumerian giant with the wild black mane and the smoldering blue eyes. The black wings of interstellar cold had brushed him, but lightly. Life had stirred and consciousness returned. He wandered to and fro across the black field, limping slightly, for there was a ghastly wound in his thigh, taken in the fury of battle and crudely bandaged as he had recovered consciousness and moved to arise. Carefully yet impatiently he moved among the dead, bloody as they were. He was splashed with gore from head to foot, and the great sword he trailed in his right hand was stained crimson to the hilt. Bone weary was Conan, and his gullet was desert dry. He ached from a score of wounds, mere cuts and scratches, save for the great slash on his thigh, and he lusted for a skin of wine and a platter of beef. As he prowled among the bodies, limping from corpse to corpse, he growled like a hungry wolf, swearing wrathfully. He had come into the Turanian war as a mercenary, owning naught but his horse, now slain, and the great sword in his hand. Now that the battle was lost, the war was ended, and he was marooned alone in the midst of the enemy land. He had at least hoped to loot the fallen of some choice pieces of gear they would no longer need, 
a gemmed dagger, a gold bracelet, a silver breastplate. A few such baubles and he could bribe his way out of the reach of Muntasim Khan and return to Zamora with a grub stake. Others had been there before him, either thieves slinking from the shadowy city or soldiers who crept back to the field from which they had fled. For the field was stripped. There was nothing left but broken swords, splintered javelins, dented helms and shields. Conan glared out across the littered plain, cursing sulphurously. He had lain in his swoon too long. Even the looters had left. He was like the wolf who lingers so late at his bloodletting that jackals have stripped the prey. In this case, human jackals. Straightening up from his fruitless quest, he gave over the search with the fatalism of a true barbarian. Time now to think of a plan. Brows knotted, scowling in thought, he glanced uncertainly afar off across the darkening plain. The square, flat-roofed towers of Yaralet stood black and solid against the dying gleam of sunset. No hope of refuge there, for one who had fought under the banners of King Yildiz. Yet no city, friend or enemy, lay nearer, and Yildiz's capital of Agrapur was hundreds of leagues south. Lost in his thoughts, he did not notice the approach of a great black figure until a faint, shuddering neigh reached his ears. He turned swiftly, favouring his injured leg, lifting the longsword threateningly, then relaxed, grinning. Crom, you startled me. So, I am not the only survivor, eh? <laughs> the tall black mare stood trembling, gazing at the naked giant with wide, frightened eyes. It was the same mount that the General Bakra had ridden. He who lay somewhere on the field, sprawled in a puddle of blood. The mare whinnied, grateful for the sound of a friendly human voice. Although not a horseman, Conan could see that she was in sad condition. Her sides heaved, lathered with the sweat of fear. Her long legs trembled with exhaustion. The devil bat had struck terror in her heart too, Conan thought grimly. He spoke soothingly, calming her, and stepped gingerly nearer until he could reach out and stroke the panting beast, gentling her into submission. In his northern homeland, horses were rare. To the penniless barbarians of the Sumerian tribes from whose loins he was sprung, the chief of great wealth owned a fine steed, or the bold warrior who had taken one in battle. But despite his ignorance of the fine points of horsemanship, Conan quieted the great black mare and vaulted into the saddle. He sat astride the horse, fumbling with the reins, and rode slowly off the field now a swamp of inky blackness in the darkness of night. He felt better. There were provisions in the saddlebags, and with a strong mare between his thighs, he had a good chance of making it alone across the bleak and barren tundras of the borders of Zamora. A low, tortured moan reached his ears. Conan jerked the reins, drawing back the black mare to a halt and peering about him suspiciously in the deep gloom. His scalp prickled in superstitious dread at the eerie sound. Then he shrugged and spat an oath. No night phantom, no hunting ghoul of the wastes. That was a cry of pain. This meant that still a third survivor of the doomed battle yet drew breath, and a living man might be presumed to be unlooted. He swung from the saddle, wrapping the reins about the spokes of a broken chariot wheel. The cry had come from the left. Here at the very edge of the battlefield, a wounded survivor might well have escaped the cunning eye of looters. Conan might ride into Zamora with a pouch full of gems yet. The Sumerian limped towards the source of the quavering moan, which came from the margin of the plain. He parted the straggling reeds that grew in shaggy clumps along the banks of the slow river and glared down at a pale figure which writhed feebly at his very feet. It was a girl. She lay there, half naked, her white limbs cut and bruised. Blood was clotting in the foaming curls of her long black hair like a chain of rubies. There was unseeing agony in her lustrous dark eyes, and she moaned in delirium. The Sumerian stood looking down at her, noting almost absently the lithe beauty of her limbs and the rounded, lush young breasts. He was puzzled 
What was a girl like this doing on a battlefield? She had not the sullen, flamboyant, sullied look of a camp troll about her. Her slim and graceful body denoted breeding, even nobility. Baffled, he shook his head, black mane swinging against brawny shoulders. At his feet, the girl stirred. The heart! The heart of Tammuz! Oh, master! Conan shrugged, and his eyes clouded momentarily by what, in another man, would have been an expression of pity. Wounded to the death, he thought grimly, and he lifted his sword to put the wench out of her misery. As the blade hovered about her white breast, she whimpered again like a child in pain. The great sword halted in mid-air, and the Cimmerian stood for an instant, motionless as a bronze statue. Then, in sudden decision, he slammed the sword back in its sheath and bent, lifting the girl effortlessly in his mighty arms. She struggled blindly, weakly, moaning in half-conscious protest. Carrying her with careful tenderness, he limped toward the reed-masked riverbank and lay her down gently on the dry, cushioned reeds, filling the cupped palms with river water. The barbarian bathed her white face and cleaned her cuts as gently as a mother might tend her child. Her wounds proved superficial, mere bruises save for the cut on her brow, and even that, though it had bled heavily, was far from mortal. Conan grunted with relief and bathed the girl's face and brow with cold, clear water. Then, awkwardly pillowing her head against his chest, he dribbled some of the water between her half-parted lips. She gasped, choked a little, and came awake, staring up at him from eyes like dark stars, clouded with bewilderment and the shadows of fear. Who? What? The bats? They're gone now, girl. You have naught to fear. Come you hither from Yarlet? Yes, yes. But who are you? Conan, a Sumerian. What is a lass like you doing on a battlefield? Conan? Conan, yes, that was the name. It was you that I seek. How strange that you should find me. And who sent you to seek me, wench? I am Hildeko, a Brythunian, slave to the House of Atlas, the Far-Seeing, who dwells yonder in Yarolet. My master sent me in secret to move among the warriors of King Yildiz, to seek one Conan, a mercenary of Sumeria, and to bring him by a private way to his house within the city. You are the man I seek. Aye, and what does your master want with me? That I know not, but he said to tell you that he means no harm, and that much gold can be yours, if you will come. Gold, eh? Yes, but I came not to the field in time to seek you before battle, so I hid in the reeds along the river's edge to avoid the warriors. And then, the bats! Suddenly they were everywhere, swooping upon the fallen, killing, and one horseman fled from them into the reeds, trampling me under his hooves unawares. What of this horseman? Bat tore him from the saddle and let his corpse fall into the river. I swooned, but in its panic the horse struck me. Lucky you were not slain. Well, lass, we shall visit this master of yours to learn what he wants of Conan and how he knows my name. You will come? Ha <laughs> ha! I am alone amid enemies in an alien land. My employment ended when Bakra's army was destroyed. Why should I scruple to meet a man who has picked me from 10,000 warriors, and who offers gold? They rode across the shallow ford of the river and across the gloom-drenched plain toward Yarolet, stronghold of Montasam Khan. And Conan's heart, which never beat more joyously than when thrilled with the promise of excitement and adventure, sang. A strange conclave was taking place in the small, velvet-hung, taper-lit chamber of Attalus, whom some men called a philosopher, others a seer, 
and others a rogue. This figure of mystery was a slender man of medium height, with a splendid head and the ascetic features of a dedicated scholar. He was clad in a plain robe of rich fabric, and his head was shaven to denote devotion to the study of the arts. As he talked in low tones with his companion, a third viewer, had any been present, might have observed something strange and curious about him, for Attalus, as he conversed, gestured with his left hand only. His right arm lay stretched across his lap in an unnatural angle, and from time to time his calm, clever features were hideously contorted with a sudden spasm of intense pain, at which time his right foot, hidden under his long robes, would twist back excruciatingly upon his ankle. His companion was one whom the city of Yaralet knew and praised as Prince Than, scion of an ancient and noble house of Turan. The prince was a tall, lithe man, young and undeniably handsome. The firm, clean outline of his soldiery limbs and the steel quality of his cool grey eyes belied the foppishness of his curled and scented black locks and jewelled cloak. Beside Attalus, who sat in a high-backed chair of dark wood carven by intricate skill, with leering gargoyles and grinning faces, stood a small table of ebony inlaid with yellow ivory. Upon this rested a huge fragment of green crystal, as large as a human head. It flickered with a weird inward glow, and from time to time the philosopher would break off his low conversation to peer deeply within the glittering stone. Will she find him? And will he come? He will come! But every moment that passes increases our danger. Even now Mentusum Khan may be watching, and it is dangerous for us to be together. And Thassum Khan lies drugged with the Dream Lotus. For the shadows of Nurgle were abroad in the hour of sunset. And some danger we must risk, if ever the city is to be freed of this bloody-handed scourge. Ah! And you know, O oh Prince, how little time is left to us. Desperate measures for desperate men. <laughs> Very little time. Ah, welcome. Thrice welcome, Conan. Come, enter. Here is wine, food. See to the wench. She was trampled by a horse, but brought me your message. Now, what is this all about? Who are you? How do you know my name? And what do you want of me? We have time for talk, but later. Eat, drink, and rest. You are wounded. Crom, take all this delay. We shall talk now. I know you, although we have never met. Because of my crystal, there. On yonder stand by the chair, within its depths, I can see and hear for a hundred leagues. Sorcery? If you like, but I am no sorcerer, only a seeker after knowledge. A philosopher, some men call me. Ah! Ha! Ha! Crom, are you sick, man? Not sick. Cursed. By this fiend who rules us with a dread scepter of hell-born magic. Muntasim Khan. And I am no sorcerer has spared my life thus far. For the Setrep slew all wizards in Yaralet. I, being but a humble philosopher, he let live. Yet he suspects that I know something of the black arts and has cursed me with this deadly scourge. It withers up my body, and tortures my nerves, and will end in a convulsion of death ere long. I, too, have been cursed by this hellspawn, for that I am next to Mentusum Khan in rank, and he thinks that I may desire his throne. Me he is tortured in another way, a sickness of the brain. Spasms of blindness that come and go, which will end by devouring my brain and leaving me a mindless, sightless, mewling thing. Crom! You are our only hope. You alone can save our city from this black-hearted devil that torments and plagues us. 
But I am no wizard, man. What a warrior could do with cold steel, I can do. But how can I combat this devil's magic? Listen, Conan of Samaria, and I will tell you a strange and awful tale. In the city of Yaralet, when night falls, the people bar their windows, bolt their doors, and sit shuddering behind these barriers, praying in terror with candles burning before their household gods, till the clean, wholesome light of dawn etches the squat towers of the city with living fire against the paling skies. No archers guard the gates. No watchmen stride the lonely streets. No thief steals nimbly through the winding alleys, nor do painted sluts simper and beckon from the dark shadows. For Yara let, rogues and honest folk alike, shun the night shadows. Thief, beggar, assassin, and be disant wench seek haven in foul-smelling dens or dim-lit taverns. From dusk to dawn, Yara let is a city of silence, a black ways, empty and desolate. It was not always thus. Once, this was a bright and prosperous city, bustling with commerce, with shops and bazaars, filled with happy people who lived under the strong hand of a wise and gentle satrap, Manthasm Khan. He taxed them lightly, ruling with justice and mercy, busy with his private collection of antiquities and in the study of these ancient objects which absorbed his keen, questing mind. The caravans of slow-pacing camels that wound from the desert gate bore always with them amongst the merchants, his agents seeking for rare and curious oddities to purchase for their master's private museum. Then he changed, and a terrible shadow fell over Yaralet. The satrap was like one under a powerful and evil spell. Where he had been kind, he became cruel. Where generous, greedy. Where just and merciful, secretive, tyrannical, and savage. Suddenly, the city guard seized men, nobles, wealthy merchants, priests, magicians, who vanished into the pits beneath the satrap's palace never to be seen again. Some whispered that a caravan from the far south had brought to him something from the depths of demon-haunted Stygia. Few had glimpsed it, and of those, one said shudderingly that the thing was carven with strange, uncouth hieroglyphs like those seen on the dusty Stygian tombs. It seemed to cast an evil spell over the satrap, and it lent him amazing powers of black sorcery. Weird forces shielded him from those despairing patriots who sought to slay him. Strange crimson lights blazed in the windows of a tall tower of his palace, where men whispered that he had converted an empty suite into a grim temple to some dark, and bloody God. And terror walked the streets of knighted Yaralet, as if summoned from the realm of death by some awesome devil purchased law. Exactly what they feared at night, the people did not know. But it was no vain dream against which they soon came to bolt their doors. Men hinted at slinking bat-like forms glimpsed from barred windows, of hovering shadowy horrors alien to human knowledge, deadly to human sanity. Tales spread of doorways splintered in the night, of sudden unearthly cries and shrieks torn from human throats, followed by significant and utter silence. And they dared to tell of the rising sun illuminating broken doors that swung in houses suddenly and unaccountably empty. The thing from Stygia was the hand of Nurgle.
It looks like a clawed hand. Carven bold ivory. Worked all over with weird glyphs in a forgotten tongue. The claws clasp a sphere of shadowy, dim crystal. I know that the satrap has it. I have seen it here, in my crystal. For although no enchanter, I have learned some of the dark arts. And you know of this thing? Uh, know of it? I! Old books speak of it and whisper the dark legend of its bloody history. The blind seer who penned the Book of Skelos knew it well. Nurgle's hand, they name it, shudderingly. They say it fell from the stars into the sunset isles of the uttermost west, ages upon ages before King Kul rose to bring the seven empires beneath his single standard. Centuries and ages beyond thought have rolled across the world since first bearded Pictish fishermen drew it dripping from the deep and stared wonderingly into its shadowy fires. They bartered it to greedy Atlantean merchants and passed it east across the world. The withered, hoary-bearded mages of the Elder Thule and Dark Grondar probed its mysteries in their towers of purple and silver. The serpent men of shadow-haunted Valusia peered into its glimmering depths. With it, Komyasoth whelmed the Thirty Kings until the Hand turned upon and slew him. The Book of Skelos says the Hand brings two gifts unto its possessor. First, power beyond all limit. Then, death beyond all despair. When all of the Elder World was broken in the Cataclysm, and the Green Sea rolled in restless fathoms above the shattered spires of lost Atlantis, and the nations sank one by one in red ruin, the hand passed from the knowledge of men. For three thousand years, the hand slept. But when the young kingdoms of Goth and Ophir awoke, and slowly emerged from the murk of barbarism, the talisman was found. The dark wizard kings of Grimatian plumbed its secrets, and when the lusty Hyborians broke that cruel kingdom beneath their heel, it passed southwards in the dusty Stygia, where the bloody priests of that black land set it to terrible purposes, in rites of which I dare not speak. It fell when some swarthy sorcerer was slain, and was buried with him, sleeping away the centuries. But now tomb robbers have roused the hand of Nurgle again, and it has come into the possession of Manthas and Khorn. The temptation of ultimate and absolute power, which it holds out to all, has corrupted him, as countless others have been corrupted, who fell beneath its insidious spell. I fear me, Cimmerian, for all these lands, now that the demon's hand wakes and dark forces walk the earth again. Well, Krom, man, what have I to do with such matters? You alone can destroy the influence of the talisman over the satrap's mind. How? You alone possess the counter talisman. I? You are mad. I hold no truck with amulets and such like magical trash. Did you not find a curious golden object before the battle? Aye, that I did. At Bahari, yester eve, as we lay in camp. Come, Conan. We shall accompany you. There is a secret passageway from this my chamber into the satrap's hall. An underground tunnel like that by which my slave, Hildikor, led you under the city streets into my house. You... Armed with the protection of the heart, shall slay Manthasm Gone, or destroy the hand of Nurgle. There is no danger, for he lies deep in a magical slumber, which comes upon him whenever he has need to summon forth the shadows of Nurgle, as he has already done this night to overwhelm the Turanian army of King Yildus. Come! Conan strode to the table and drained the last of the wine. 
Then, shrugging, muttering an oath to Krom, he followed the limping seer and the slim prince into a dark opening behind an arras. In a moment they were gone, and the chamber lay empty and silent as the grave. The only motion came from flickering lights within the green, jagged crystal beside the chair. Within its depths, one could see the small figure of Montasim Khan, lying in a drugged sleep within his mighty hall. They strode through endless darkness. Water dripped from the roof of the rock-hewn tunnel, and now and then the red eyes of rats gleamed at them from the tunnel's floor gleamed and were gone with squeaks of rage as a small scavengers fled before the footsteps of the strange beings who invaded their subterranean domain. Atalus went first, trailing his one good hand along the wet, uneven cavern wall. I would not set this task on you, my young friend, but it was into your hands the heart of Tammuz fell, and I sense a purpose, a destiny in its choice. There is an affinity between opposed forces, such as the dark power we symbolize as Nurgle, and the power of light we call Tammuz. The heart awoke, and, in some manner beyond knowledge, caused itself to be found. For the hand was also awake, and working its dread purpose. Thus I commend you to this task, for the powers seem to have singled you for this deed. Hush! We are beneath the palace now. We are almost there. They stood at one end of a vast, shadow-filled hall, whose high vaulted roof was lost in darkness overhead. In the center of the hall, which was otherwise empty save for rows of mighty columns, stood a square dais, and upon the dais, a massive throne of black marble, and upon the throne, Montasim Khan. He was of middle years, but thin and wasted, gaunt to the point of emaciation, paper-white, unhealthy flesh and shrunken upon his skull-like face, and dark circles shadowed his hollow eyes. Clasped across his chest, as he lay sprawled in the throne, he held an ivory rod like a scepter. Its end was worked into a demon's claw, grasping a smoky crystal that pulsed like a living heart with slow fires. Beside the throne, a dish of brass smoked with narcotic incense. The dream lotus whose fumes empowered the sorcerer to release the shadow demons of Nurgle. Atalus tugged at Conan's arm. See, he still sleeps. The heart will protect you. Seize the ivory hand from him, and all his power will be gone. Ah, gentlemen, I have been expecting you. On the dais, Montasim Khan smiled down at them as they froze in astonishment. His tones were gentle, but a fury of mad rage flamed in his sick eyes. He lifted the ivory scepter of power. He gestured. The lights flickered eerily, and suddenly... Shockingly, the limping seer screamed, his muscles contorted in a spasm of unendurable agony. He fell forward on the marble flags, writhing in pain. Krom! Prince Than plucked at his rapier, but a gesture of the magic hand stayed him. His eyes went blank and dead. Icy sweat started from his paling brow. He shrieked and sank to his knees clawing frantically at his brow as pangs of blinding pain tore through his brain. And you, my young barbarian. <laughs> Conan sprang. He moved like a striking panther, burly limbs a blur of speed. He was upon the first step of the dais before Montasim Khan could move. His sword flashed up, wavered, and fell from his strengthless hands. A wave of arctic cold numbed his limbs. It radiated from the cloudy gem within the ivory claw. He gasped for breath. 
the burning eyes of Montasim Khan blazed into his. The skull-like face chuckled with a ghastly imitation of mirth. <laughs> the heart protects in very truth, but only him who knows how to invoke its power. <laughs> the satrap gloated, chuckling as the Sumerian strove to summon strength into his iron limbs again. Conan set his jaw and fought grimly, savagely against the tide of chill and fetid darkness that poured in black rays from the demonic crystal and slowly blurred his mind. Strength drained from his limbs as wine from a slashed wineskin. He sank to his knees, then slumped at the foot of the dais. He felt his consciousness shrink to a tiny, lone point of light, lost in a vast abyss of roaring darkness. The last spark of will wavered like a candle flame in the gale, hopeless, yet with the fierce, indomitable determination of his savage breed, he fought on. A woman screamed, startled. Montasim Khan jerked at the unexpected sound. His attention flickered away from Conan, his focus broke, and in that brief instant, the slim white form of a nude girl with dark flashing eyes and a black torrent of foaming curls ran on swift feet across the pave from the shadows of a column to the side of the helpless Sumerian. Through the roaring haze, Conan gaped at her, Hildeko. Swift as thought, she knelt by his side. One white hand dipped into his pouch and emerged, clutching the heart of Tammuz. She sprang lively to her feet and hurled the counter talisman at Montasim Khan. It caught him full between the eyes with an audible thud. Eyes filming, he sank bonelessly into the cushioned embrace of his black throne. The hand of Nurgle slid from his nerveless fingers to clank against the marble stand. In the instant the talisman fell from the satrap's grip, the spell that bound Atlas and Prince Than in webs of scarlet agony snapped. Pale, shaken, exhausted, they were whole, and Conan's mighty strength poured back into his sprawled body. Cursing, he leapt to his feet. One hand caught Hildeko's rounded shoulder and spun her away out of danger, while with his other, he snatched up his sword from the marble pave. Poised, he was ready to strike. But he stopped, blinking with astonishment. At either side of the satrap's body lay the two talismans, and from both arose weird shapes of force. From the hand of Nurgle, a darkly shimmering web of evil radiance spread, a glow of darkness like the sheen of polished ebony. The fetor of the pit was its unholy breath, and the bone-deep chill of interstellar space was its blinding touch. Before its subtle advance, the orange glare of the tortoise faded. It grew larger, fringed with rising tentacles of radiant blackness. But a nimbus of golden glory strengthened about the heart of Tammuz and rose forming a cloud of dazzling amber fire. The warmth of a thousand honey-hearted springs flowed from it, negating the arctic chill, and shafts of rich gold light cleaved the inky web of Nurgle. The two cosmic forces met and fought. From this battle of the gods, Conan retreated with reluctant steps, joining his shaken comrades. He stood with them, staring with awe at the unimaginable conflict. Trembling, the nude form of Hildeko shrank into the shelter of his arm. How did you get here, girl? I awoke, recovering from my swoon, and came into the Master's chamber, ending it empty. But within the Master's crystal of seership, I saw your simulacra enter the Satrap's hall and watched as he awoke and faced you. I, I followed and finding you in his power, chanced all on a try for the heart. Lucky for all that you did. Look! The golden fog of Tammuz was now a giant flashing figure of intolerable light, dimly manlike in configuration, but huge as those colossi hewn from the stone cliffs of Shem by age-forgotten hands. The dark shape of Nurgle, too, 
had swelled into giant proportions. It was now a vast, ebon thing, brutal, hulking, misshapen, more like some stupendous ape than manlike. In the foggy hump that was its brutal-like head, slitted eyes of malignant fire blazed like emerald stars. The two forces came together with a thunderous, shattering roar like colliding worlds. The very walls shook at the fury of their meeting. Some half-forgotten sense within their flesh told the four that titanic cosmic forces drove and fought. The air was filled with the bitter stench of ozone. Foot-long sparks of electric fire crackled and snapped through the roiling fury as the Golden God and the Shadowy Demon came together. Shafts of unendurable brilliance tore through the clotted, struggling shadow form. Bolts of blazing glory ripped it into shreds of drifting darkness. For a moment, the dark web enshrouded and dimmed the golden flashing shape. But for a moment only, another roar of earth-shattering thunder, and the Black One dissolved before the embrace of intolerable brightness. Then, it was gone. And for a moment, the figure of light towered above the dais, consuming it like a funeral pyre. Then it, too, was gone. Silence reigned in the thunder-riven hall of Montasim Khan. Upon the blasted dais, both talismans had vanished. Whether reduced to atoms by the fury of the cosmic forces that had been released here, or transported to some far place to await the next awakening of the beings they symbolized and contained, none could say. The heart is always stronger than the hand. Conan reined the black steed with a rough but masterly hand. It trembled, eager to be off, hooves ringing in the cobbles. He grinned his barbaric blood thrilling to the might of the superb mare. A vast cloak of crimson silk belled from his broad shoulders, and his coat of silvered iron mesh mail glittered in the morning light. You are determined, then, to leave us, Conan? Aye, the Santrop's guard is a tame place, and I hunger for this new war King Yildiz is mounting against the hill tribes. A week of inaction, and I've had my belly full of peace. So... Fare you well, then, Atalus. Odd that a mercenary like Conan would accept less in payment than he could get. I offered him a chest full of gold, enough to support him for life. But he would only take one small sack, together with the horse he found on the battlefield and his pick of arms and garments. Too much gold, he said, would only slow him down. Atalus shrugged, then smiled pointing to the far end of the courtyard. A slim Brythunian girl with long mane of black curls appeared in the doorway. She came up to Conan, who drew the mare to a halt. He bent to speak with her. They exchanged a few words. Then he reached down and caught her supple waist and swung her up before him onto the saddle. She sat sideways, clinging with both arms to his burly neck. Her face buried in his breast. <laughs> Some men fight for things other than gold. 